Without further ado, uh, my friend, my colleague, Jim Olson, thank you for coming. Thank you, Rich. Um, unlike a lot of the speakers who come here, I also department a personal uh, Dr. Shaker was a surgeon who cared for my mom five years ago, and she had a tumor that most people would have considered inoperable, and everybody would have considered incurable, and now five years later, she's got a better social life than I do, and going strong, so uh, she received beautiful care here, uh, and up in the uh, NICU, the, the nurse surgical ICU here, uh, everything was outstanding, so I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart, and all of you that I've had a chance to work with as well. So for those of you who haven't heard me speak before, <clears throat> I'd like to start by introducing my CEO. Uh, this is Hayden, who I took care of uh, in the first years when I was here as a fellow. And he was a little guy who, for those of you who are on uh, Zoom, can you put yourself on mute because you're coming through the microphone? Um, Hayden was a patient that I cared for. He was a two-year-old when we diagnosed him. And then uh, he was <laughs> alive until he was about six years old. And it was at his memorial service, his eight-year-old brother was given this eulogy, and I was sitting in the back thinking, no eight-year-old should have to give a eulogy for their little brother. And it was kind of that day that I decided that we were gonna do everything in my lab, not for academic purposes, not trying to get the next grant, not trying to get the next paper, but instead by doing experiments that would likely lead to, or possibly lead to a change for families like Hayden's. And so this is the guy that we answer to, uh, to this day. And the first project that Rich mentioned that I'll talk to you about is tumor paint. And this is a really important slide, particularly for those of you who don't do pediatrics. If you look across different pediatric cancers, the likelihood of surviving for five years is dramatically different whether you get a gross total resection or not. You don't need to get every cancer cell out. You can leave microscopic disease. You can even see disease that you see on the MRI. But the difference between having a gross total resection and an incomplete section with bulky disease is 42% versus 0% for glioblastoma. And you can go down the list and see that that uh, continues. Even for adult glioblastomas, there's now a lot of literature that shows that the more extensive the resection is, the longer the patients are likely to live. And so I really believe that there's a need for improved techniques to help you as surgeons make good clinical decisions as you're going. This is a case that Rich and I shared and. Uh, was the basis on uh, which we started the tumor paint project with Patrick Kabikian from their department. A uh, 16 year old girl, aberrant, stop finding here, you all know what that is. Look at the brain, and you know, it looks, it's really hard to distinguish what is cancer from what is normal. And as you can see over here, you're right next to the primary motor strip. And in this case, even after an extensive surgery with all the tools that were available uh, to your team, uh, there was some residual disease left at the end of the surgery, and you have that difficulty that we face of uh, do we go back to the operating room? Uh, do we uh, allow this to proceed with radiation and chemotherapy and wonder whether those cells are already resistant to those molecules? And so skipping over a lot of the work that Patrick did, because this is all published, uh, we turned to a molecule that comes from the Israeli death stalker scorpion. The molecule is called chlorotoxin. It's shown here. And one of the things that makes chlorotoxin unique is that it has four disulfide bridges that tie this little mini protein into a knot. And that knot gives it unique pharmacological properties uh, that are kind of ideal for a drug. Uh, it's tied so tightly in a knot that it can't be broken down by proteases and can't be presented to the immune system. So it's one of the few protein drugs that is not immunogenic to the best of our knowledge. There's a lot of other nice things about it that I'll get to later. And initially in the laboratory, we attached that in Michin Zhang's lab to uh, Psi 5.5 as a way to light up uh, cancers in mouse models. And later, as this transferred from our laboratory at Fred Hutch to Blaze Bioscience, they changed that dye to endocyamine green because ICG had been used for decades safely in human patients uh, by surgeons. So I'm going to show you just a few pictures from Amy Lee's uh, uh, surgeries over at uh, Children's and a couple others. Uh, you guys will see some of this presented by neurosurgeons who are much better prepared to talk about the surgeries. Uh, but I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of where we are right now uh, through the clinical trials that Blaze is running. Uh, this is the beginning of a surgery with a three-year-old from Eastern Washington uh, without and with tumor paint. And you can see that it's able to provide, even with this early imaging system that we had, which was a, a pretty poor system compared to what we have right now, it was able to give a nice signal uh, to help get the surgery started. And at this time, the 
uh, camera that we were using was a big bulky thing that had to be moved in and out with the surgical microscope. At the end of the case, when Amy felt that the uh, tumor that she could see uh, had been resected, uh, we turned the laser, they turned the laser on again, and there's still a little spot left. And it turns out that some normal brain had covered a little spot of the tumor. Uh, she resected that. And this little girl has since not received any chemotherapy or any radiation therapy. And even though this was a recurrent tumor, she's been disease-free for almost two years now. Uh, so that's a, a, what I hope that we have a lot more stories like that in the future coming out of it. I'd like to show this next slide, which came from one of the adult glioblastoma trials. Uh, as you can see, the tumor has been removed up here, and the tumor paint is kind of shining through down below. And the reason I like to show this is because the tumor in this case is about a half centimeter to a centimeter below the surface of the brain. And we chose to use a near-infrared light so it would shine through normal tissue, like I showed you in the last case and now in this case, uh, to give you guys ideas of where there might be cancer that you can't uh, visualize, and also to help, in some cases, choose the safest route to get there. And so the purpose of this slide is simply to convey that uh, this dye that we're using is able to shine through normal tissue. Uh, the imaging system that is currently being used is called the Canvas Imaging System. And the nice thing about it is that it attaches to the surgical microscope. And eventually, the image will come directly through the eyepieces of the surgical microscope. And you can see the improvement uh, over time in the quality of the imaging. Uh, the dye was always doing the exact same thing, but now the imaging devices are getting better and better. And this is just in a matter of about three years that we've gone from something that looks like a 1950s black and white TV to uh, something like you see here in the center. And on the top, I'm showing you a low-grade tumor, and on the bottom, a high-grade tumor. And the importance of this is things like 5-ALA uh, are really difficult for lighting up low-grade tumors. And as you know, those are uh, particularly important to get good surgical resection uh, for those tumors. Uh, and certainly for in pediatrics, that's the case. So where we are right now is that we've enrolled, uh, we've completed four safety studies for phase one clinical trials in patients with skin cancer breast cancer, adult glioblastomas, and children with a variety of different cancers. Uh, the national pivotal clinical trial that could lead to FDA registration in approximately 2021 is currently underway. Seattle Children's is leading that. Uh, it's been a joint effort between UW, uh, Children's Hospital, and Fred Hutch uh, all the way along. There's intellectual property in all three of those places. Sarah Leary is leading this uh, national clinical trial. It'll eventually be open at most of the PNOC sites, which is a consortium of about 15 sites around the country. Importantly, we haven't identified any dose-limiting toxicity in all 100 patients that we've treated so far. It's lighting up most of the cancers, not all of them. Uh, we haven't figured out why some tumors are not lighting up. It's a very small minority of tumors that are not lighting up. Uh, because it has potential to work for breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, lung cancer, skin cancers, uh, we have the potential to help as many as 2.5 million patients per year just in the US and Europe alone. And as I said, the FDA registration study is underway with guidance from the FDA about the design of that trial. So moving on to um, brainstem gliomas and other types of cancers that affect kids, I wanna move on from what we did after we worked on tumor paint. We then licensed that technology out to Blaze Bioscience, a startup that came out of our institutions here in Seattle. And then I had an opportunity to kind of rebuild my lab. And in rebuilding the lab, the question was, what can we do that nobody else in the world can do? And at the time, we had this decade of experience on working with these mini proteins that are disulfide bonded and really have a lot of interesting drug-like properties. I'm a pharmacologist by training. And I thought that this was really an unexplored area of medicine. The molecules that come from scorpions and spiders and sunflowers and violets and almost every clade of life are passed down genetically through DNA. Most of these mini proteins, some of them called notins, have 20 to 60 amino acids, and they're tied together by these disulfide bridges. Uh, this gives them unique pharmacologic properties, and they've really been untapped. People had this, like most good ideas, people had this idea in 1990, 1991. Drug companies invested lots of money and lots of time trying to turn these into drugs for human patients. The problem was that they were using yeast and bacteria to try to make them. And these proteins don't fold properly. They, they, those organisms don't have the right machinery to fold these disulfide bridges properly. So what our team did uniquely was I brought on Chris Malin from Amgen and Colin Frank, who just finished his graduate degree that day uh, at Fred Hutch and UW. And those two formed a team 
that tried out 11 different systems for producing these. And the one that we ultimately used is one in which we used immortalized mammalian human embryonic kidney cells as factories to produce these drugs. And now instead of one in every 30,000 folding properly, about one in every two folds properly. So it has been able to turn it into a real platform. So what's different about these medicines or these drug candidates from other drugs that you prescribe every day? On this image, I'm showing a picture of aspirin in the uh, enzymatic pocket of COX-2. Uh, how many of you are young enough to see aspirin in this picture? Uh, three, four? Oh, neurosurgeons? Come on. <laughs> here it is, right here. It's, it's, it's a very tiny molecule deep in the pocket of an enzyme. That's how most of the drugs that are FDA approved work right now, with the exception of antibodies. But the reality is most of the diseases that we want to treat in the future that are currently untreated by the drugs that we have are not enzymatically driven diseases. They're diseases where two proteins are talking to each other inappropriately and driving the disease, like cancer happens all the time. I'll show you an example of YAP and T, two molecules that help drive some glioblastomas and other brain tumors and other cancers a little later in the talk. So if these are small molecules like aspirin or chemotherapy agents or uh, hypertension drugs, and you know about antibodies, huge drugs like Avastin. Uh, what we're talking about is these mid-sized medicines that are about the size of cyclosporin, but are DNA encoded. And because they're that right size, they're actually large enough to be able to interfere with protein-protein interactions or bind to ion channels and modulate their activity. In fact, that's what they do a lot uh, in nature. As I mentioned, these are disulfide bonded and tied in a knot. That makes them less immunogenic. It makes them really stable. We can take these molecules and put them in simulated gastric fluid that has a pH of two. We can add pepsin and trypsin at the highest concentrations that can stay in solution. And about half of these molecules will not break down even under these conditions. So one of the things we're working on is drugs for the GI tract where you don't have to take a drug, have it go through the whole body, and have just a minuscule part of it come back to treat your C. diff or whatever you have going on in your gut. We're working on medicines you can take orally and they would be able to get through the stomach and small intestines and work in the gut. I won't be showing that work today because I'm going to focus on brain uh, components. One of the things I love about science and research is that sometimes you get to do things just purely for fun. I love doing translational research where we are trying to get a drug ready for patient uh, administration, but sometimes it's just fun to see what's out there in nature. And so we decided to make 48 proteins that come from scorpions and just see where they went in the body. So we produced and manufactured these 48 proteins, we radio labeled them. We injected them into mice, and three hours later, we sacrificed the mice, put them into a block of ice, basically, and sliced them from nose to tail, and put them against a film so that you can see where the drugs are going. And we can look at 32 different tissues and organs in this manner. One of the things we were looking for was to see if any of these drugs or, that came from scorpions were able to get into the brain besides fluorotoxin, the molecule that we use for tumor pain. And indeed, we found four molecules that had pretty good brain penetration. Um, and these were at levels of 10 to 15 percent of what you see in the bloodstream, which is about what most brain drugs, most drugs that are approved for depression or schizophrenia, most of them get into the brain at about that level. We had one that was really fascinating to me because after giving an IV administration of this drug, three hours later, it was very highly accumulating in the cerebral spinal fluid. So if you look at lateral, lateral ventricle there, the arrow. If you look closely, you'll see the rostral microchord stream of neurons coming up toward the olfactory uh, part of the, of the mouse. So what that means is that in a period of three hours, this molecule got from the bloodstream into the CSF and had access to the neural stem cells that are in the subventricular zone. And so I'm not aware of any other molecule that's like that. And I just recruited in a scientist uh, who was going to take on this project uh, and begin to understand, can we carry payloads that can be therapeutic for people with Alzheimer's disease or neurodevelopmental disorders or other places where you'd like to manipulate the stem cells in the brain uh, by using this drug as a carrier. We also, I'm going to go off of the brain for just a few minutes because there's some really cool stuff that I'd like to share with you. We saw that some of these molecules accumulated in the proximal tubules of the kidney and in fact we could attach a payload, in this case a cyanine dye, and show that it would very specifically accumulate in the proximal tubules of the kidney. And this is where renal, acute renal injury converts into chronic renal disease, and people need dialysis or kidney transplants and such, almost always in the proximal tubules. An inflammatory process will occur, sclerosis will occur, and eventually the kidneys will fail. So 
thinking about delivering anti-inflammatory drugs to these areas, antisclerotic drugs, uh, could potentially help a lot of people in the long run. And finally, my favorite of these 48 molecules, we had um, about four of them that went to all the cartilage in the body. So here you see the shoulder, elbow, knee, and hip. And the crazy thing is that these molecules begin accumulating within five minutes of administration, and they stay there for days. <coughs> And this is important because when you think about arthritis and the reason that arthritis drugs we use now are so ineffective is because cartilage is avascular. And so most drugs can't get into cartilage. And here we have a molecule that's accumulating in cartilage and accumulating rapidly and staying for days. So that'd be really interesting to use these as a carrier for uh, anti-arthritis drugs. And here you can see that we got some human cartilage. We started by just going to Safeway and getting some pig cartilage out of the uh, meat section, <laughs> and then we went on to uh, uh, talking to Chappie, Conrad, and getting some human cartilage from surgery. And you can see here that when we have the, the drug candidate that comes from the scorpion tied to Cy 5.5, that it lights up in the cartilage, but a non-targeting peptide doesn't, and nor does the dye alone. We then want to see if we can carry a payload to it, and so we attached dexamethasone, a really potent steroid, to uh, the uh, peptide, and you can see here the staining in brown that all the cartilage uh, is showing high levels of dexamethasone. On the bottom, what we're showing you is when we take just dexamethasone, unconjugated to anything, and inject it into the mouse at therapeutic doses, and you're not seeing any of it in the cartilage. As I said, cartilage is avascular, and here this drug that's being used to treat patients for arthritis uh, is not even getting there. So I have a friend who's a retired pathologist who has broken 42 bones because she was treated with steroids for her juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as a child. And so as I developed these molecules with the team in the lab, our thought is, what kind of molecules could we make that somebody could take for decades without having serious side effects? So this project has been a total ass kicker for the last four years. We have tried to conjugate a steroid to this molecule and cause the arthritis in the joints to go away without causing systemic side effects to get that therapeutic window that we would need to treat pediatric patients or adult patients. And I'm really happy to say that just about nine days ago, we finally got it after trying multiple different payloads. We finally found a steroid that is super potent when it gets into the joints, made all the joints come back to normal size and no signs of inflammation. And there was absolutely no sign of, uh, of systemic exposure. We used the um, mass of the thymus as a measure of whether or not the uh, steroids are causing a reduction in, in white blood cells in the periphery. So... Uh, this is going to be hopefully partnered out soon, uh, hopefully with a big pharmaceutical company that will develop this as an anti-arthritis drug. And uh, we've got a list of people who want to enroll in those trials already started. <laughs> so now I'm going to move on to uh, the kind of the meat of the talk today, which is that we really want to uh, be able to, yeah, question. Can you just talk briefly, you mentioned about how, what, talk, what determines the specificity of these toxins and like why they're too late? Surface cells, are they getting taken cellularly? What's the, I guess, what's the insight? Yeah, the diversity of these molecules and why they behave the way that they do is as very evident as small molecules. Um, so it's going to be different for each one of them. And in some cases, it's going to be really hard to figure out. So with chlorotoxin, the original target was thought to be a chloride ion channel chain. Uh, we disproved that. Uh, it was then thought to be matrix of caliproteins 2. Uh, we disproved that. It was then thought to be an X and A2. We disproved that. Uh, so we've got zero papers, three disproved targets. <laughs> We're getting really good at, at showing what it's not binding to, um, but all of our efforts to show what it is binding to have been unsuccessful so far. Uh, one of the things that is really interesting about chlorotoxin is that both the V and the L version will accumulate in tumors. Uh, and so that's probably suggesting that its receptor is not a protein, but it might be a glycan or something that is less stereo specific uh, than a protein. Along those lines, how much of uh, how early in the evolution of a cell into a tumor does the chlorotoxin attach itself? In other words, if you were to look at you know gliomas, for instance, we know that there's uh, chemicals that go along with various tracks and so on. So uh, you need a certain amount of tumor inside the cell for the toxin to be evident. Um, yeah, the the what we have learned so far um, is that in the pediatric tumor group, we've seen both low grade and high grade ephemeral allele acidic that, that all of those different types are lighting up. 
but it's not absolutely uniform across all of them. So there's about 10% of tumors that don't light out for reasons that we don't understand. In terms of where in the evolution of a cancer cell they first start taking up the dye, that's a really hard question to answer because we don't have particularly good models that have different stages of cancer cell evolution. Probably the best that we can get to would be using Eric Collins, our cast mice, um, at very different stages along the way since that is genetically driven. Uh, we haven't done those experiments yet, but they'd be really interesting to do. Um, what we do know, by like getting to your question about sensitivity, is that that depends more on the imaging device than on the molecule itself. So in some pictures that I did show today in, the, in laboratory animals, and even in this histopathology slides from human patients, we can see a dozen or a couple dozen tumor cells if you have a really high resolution device that can pick those up. The problem is that those devices are slow. And so they have a very narrow range of field and, and they're extremely slow at accumulating the data. So they're fine for laboratory studies, but they're probably not gonna be what you guys are using in the operating room in the near future. So certainly in the OR, um, I think that it's reasonable to say that you'd be able to pick up things that are sub-millimeter in diameter, but probably not in the range of dozens of hundreds of cells with the devices that are available commercially right now. There are definitely some devices that are kind of 10 point things where if you had an area that you really wanted to interrogate, you could get a higher resolution than that. One, sorry, um, have you been able to link the protein molecule with any other molecules that cause uh, self-destruction of the cell, like uh, apopt apoptosis in the cell, so that you don't have to yeah. actually make it? Yeah, so the question is, and we tried putting a therapeutic payload on chlorotoxin to see if we could kill the cancer cells. And we've been working on that for about eight years now. And we were able to conjugate some potent uh, cytotoxic chemotherapies on it. But we abandoned that project because the bar is so high for killing every cancer cell. And to kill 90% of them, it doesn't do you any good, right? The other 10% are going to come back and repopulate the tumor. If you look across the whole field of antibody drug conjugates, there's only a couple that are approved, and there's hundreds of failures. And the reason for this is just there's too much resistance against even potent cytotoxic agents uh, by cancer cells to, I think, make most peptide drug conjugates or antibody drug conjugates work. So our experience was that we could absolutely kill cancer cells, brain cancer cells that way. But we couldn't kill enough of them. And in the process, because these molecules are eliminated through the kidney, we were also killing some of the kidney cells, and there just wasn't a therapeutic window that we'd be looking for. So where we've gone with that instead is that we're now conjugating immunoregulatory molecules on chlorotoxin to see if we can activate the innate immune system, which then can use more of its um, adaptability uh, to go after the cancer cells. So those things are underway right now. All right, so I'll move on to this next part, which is everything we've talked about so far is finding drugs in nature, seeing where they go, and seeing can we carry a payload that would be useful on them. We thought it'd be really interesting to see if we could design molecules like this that would do exactly what we want them to do. The likelihood that we'll find some newt who had a molecule that is useful for treating epilepsy is, is pretty low, right? So we want to see can we come up with a molecule. And so Zach Crook, who's in my lab, and who is an IPD fellow at David Baker's lab at UW, asked me for a candidate target to go after, uh, that he could design a molecule that would prevent two proteins from interacting with each other. And the target I suggested to him was the YAP-T interaction. And uh, part of this was kind of diabolical as a mentor because the drug company's been going after this for decades and they spent billions of dollars on it and nothing to show for it. It's a really, really hard target because teed is shaped like my fist and yap is shaped like a C shape that goes around it. I'll show you that in just a second. So there's a lot of surface area, but it's very linear. It's just absolutely difficult to block this with the drug. So for those of you who are not familiar with yap teed, they're part of the hippo pathway. And the hippo pathway is really important as we're developing as embryos and fetuses. It drives cell proliferation and it gets shut down then after we're born. Um, but in a number of cancers, it comes back on inappropriately. It's not caused by mutations in the cancer. It's usually caused by an amplification of one or both of the molecules we're talking about. But there's been a huge desire to be able to drug this pathway uh, for a lot of years, but with very little success in it. So here's an example of a T. 
which is shown here in the green space filling diagram that looks like my fist. And here you see gap wrapping around it and how difficult that would be to block with a molecule that's the size of Gleevec or aspirin or something like that. What we decided to do is to break this down and focus on one helix of YAP. You can see how it's sliding into a groove of T. Then we'll focus on that area where we can see exactly where the amino acids are interacting between the two proteins and get rid of the other stuff and focus on designing around this part using Rosetta and other uh, protein design tools. We came up with several molecules that fit down into this groove and we could map out exactly where the amino acids were interacting. And when we mutated those amino acids that are down in the groove and interacting, the ability to block the app binding to seed went away. So we knew that we had a molecule that was doing exactly what we wanted it to do by the mechanism that we thought that it was doing it by. We then went on to make sure that, first of all, that what we were making was a single product. You can see here the beautiful single peak. A lot of protein science is all screwed up because people are working with these messy proteins and have, particularly when you have three or four disulfide bridges, you can imagine that you can have a lot of different isomers, but we work on those that have enough energetic drive to make just a single species. You can also see by surface plasma resonance that the more we add, the better it binds. This, this side of the SPR curve looks really good, but for those of you who are not familiar with SPR, this side it looks terrible. So what this means is that it binds just fine, but it falls off of T really fast. And so that's going to be a problem because normally the app doesn't fall off of T really fast and they'll hang on there and be really hard to work with the drug. So we needed to make it better in that specific way. And this is, you know, traditionally would have been years and years and years of work. But through work that uh, Zach worked on with David Baker's lab, we were able to replace every single amino acid with, an with every other amino acid make all 675 proteins and test them in one fell swoop uh, in the laboratory. And we can identify everything that's shown here in red is a amino acid substitution that made it bind better and stay longer. And so we combine five of those mutations and turn it into a second generation molecule that now could fit down into this groove, could bind really well, but it didn't leave right away, it stayed on. And so here you see the First generation molecule could not really block yap and T very well because it came off so fast. And the second generation molecule could block it really beautifully. And again, showing that the second generation molecule, looking at the ability of yap and T to bind together, is really reduced compared to the first generation molecule or controls. And so this molecule, we published this in Nature Communications. The problem with this molecule right now is that. We designed it as a proof of concept to simply see who would prevent gap from binding to T. We were able to show that we could do that. But the only way that we could get that data at the end that showed that we could prevent that interaction, prevent the pathway from going out, was by transfecting the protein into the cells because it's not naturally self penetrating. Most of these molecules are not naturally self penetrating. So we hired Stephen Chen from a biotech company down in San Francisco. He's been working for the last two years on ways to make these molecules penetrate into cells because. When you think about where the protein-protein interactions are that are driving a lot of diseases, that's where they occur. And so we're in a big campaign right now to finalize that work. We've got some molecules that are getting this teed and yap blocker into cells, um, and I'm hoping that within a few months to the end of the year, uh, we'll have something that would actually bring the pharmaceutical companies and say, hey, would you be able to do this? But the important thing is that in terms of blocking the yap teed interaction, the molecule that Zach came up with uh, binds to YAP to prevent T interaction with a KD of 368 picomolar. And the best that's published in any of the patents by the drug companies is over one micromolar. So it's over a thousand times better affinity for the target than anything that the drug companies came up with over that decade that they were working on this pathway. So I think we're going to get there uh, with the cell penetration, uh, but we have some work to do. It's not an, a simple uh, problem and, and a lot of things that people have tried before things like TAT, the HIV protein and others are um, really overblown for for what people think that they can do when you're talking about actually really making a drug if you want to do an experiment in the lab sure you can get any protein into any cell but if you want to make a drug for people uh, the bar is much higher so the last uh, vignette that I'm going to show you is a project that is unpublished that we just uh, submitted for publication last week 
And this is focusing on can we find a molecule that binds to the transparent receptor and flips things into the brain, okay? So you're all familiar with blood-brain barrier keeping important drugs out of the brain. And we decided to go after a transparent receptor for two reasons. One is because we know that transparent receptor shuttles a lot of transparent into the brain uh, because so much iron is needed by the brain and this is the mechanism by which it gets there. But also because transparent receptor is really high in, in concentration and density on glioblastoma and some other brain tumor cells. So if we're able to find something that could shuttle other drugs into the brain for schizophrenia or depression or Alzheimer's disease, that's terrific, but if we get a twofer, and it's a molecule that could also carry a payload to glioblastoma cells, then along the lines of Shake's question, we could um, carry therapeutics as well to the tumor. So what I didn't go into detail about is that since we started this project, uh, Fred Hutch has invested over $20 million into our protein therapeutics program, and we really run it like a biotech company. We've got about a third of the team members came from industry. The team has worked hands-on on eight FDA-approved drugs and 24 other drugs that are in human clinical trials. So everything that we do is with this uh, product in mind uh, at the end that we're going for. And in the process of doing this, one of the things that we did was we said, you know, we're gonna need a lot more diversity in our protein peptide library than we could have before. If you think about it, all the other scientists in the world have discovered about 2,000 of these knotted peptide proteins over the course of about 30 years. And as good scientists do, created a website where all this information was publicly available and it's really a beautiful setup. So 2,000 proteins is not anything in terms of diversity. So we hired a guy from Oracle down in San Francisco and he wrote a Python program and discovered another 80,000 of these molecules in a day and a half. Uh, <laughs> and so that's, that's how you do research in Seattle in 2014, right? This is a, uh, a cutting edge place that allows you to do those sorts of things. And from those 8,000 molecules that we discovered, we had the robots that we built made about 10,000 of them. We found out which of them folded properly, which of them were stable, which of them had the properties that we wanted. And from that, we then made a diversity library of 10 million compounds. Uh, we're working on one that will be in the billions uh, within the next year or two. But the point here is that unlike the last vignette that I showed you, where we computationally designed how to fit in that groove of feed, we felt that if we have enough candidates and enough diversity, that we could go after almost any target, whether you have structural information or not, just by panning for those molecules to bind and then improving on them. And so, again, the uh, transparent receptor is on the endothelial surface, and usually transparent or antibodies against the transparent receptor will come into cells, and some of them will get recycled, uh, but others will make it all the way through the perivascular space and into the brain, which is why we went after this target. We also had some industry experience working with a partner who just focuses on this problem, and we learned a lot in that process, which is what gave us confidence to go forward in the space. So importantly, as I mentioned, um, these small molecules, not only are they good because they're stable and such, but also they can penetrate into tumors better than a lot of other drugs. So here you see a glioblastoma being grown on the back of a mouse. You see the part of it that's vascularized, the part of it that's avascular. And importantly, here's a radio labeled one of these little peptides, and you can see that there's nice homogeneous staining throughout the tumor. So these are able to get to places that antibodies, even some small molecules, can't get to. I'm going to make a long story short in that we panned through this 10 million compound library. We found a candidate, we improved it. I'll show you how we did that in the next slide. Um, but you can see that this molecule that we came up with fits perfectly down into a groove of transparent receptor, actually the same groove that transparent binds into. And this is the way that we do that. Usually we use these embryonic kidney cells to make these mini <coughs> proteins and spit them out, they're little factories that spit it out into the media. And we make sure that we use serum-free media so we can purify these drugs easily and use them for subsequent experiments. But in this case, Zach designed these peptide drugs in a way that they have a little stop that makes them stick out on the surface of the cell that's producing them like lollipops, but they're attached to the cell. Because they're attached to the cell, it means that they're tethered to the DNA that encodes them. So we can take our target, like in this case, the transparent receptor, and fluorescently tag it or put magnetic beads on it and flow it over the billions of cells that are making millions of candidate molecules, and it will stick to those that are making molecules that bind uh, to the target of interest. 
We can then use the fluorescence or magnetic feeds to pull out these cells, and we do deep sequencing to find out which, which peptides they were making. So you can see a nice enrichment of those cells that are making the best drug candidates. And in this case, we found a molecule. This is basically another version of how we do that study. And the way that the data looks is that after you sort it, you start seeing this little cluster of cells. The more cycles that you do of this that start coming up, and those are the cells that contain the DNA that encode the good binders. And we just see this that to find it. So in this case, we found the generation one, which is the second line on the top. And again, you see the same thing that we saw with the T binder, that when you're doing surface plasma resonance, and you stop putting the new drug on, you see that it falls off really fast, okay? And then we made subsequent generations using saturated immunogenesis, like I told you about, and now you can see that these come off slower and start looking a lot like, if this was a regular drug that we just wanted to bind to its receptor and stay there, we'd definitely choose generation number three. But remember, this is the transparent receptor, we want it to flip the, the payload into the brain, but we don't want it to hang on to it once it's on the other side, because otherwise you're just, you're just not getting your drug into the brain. So we experimentally want to go through and find out which ones can actually release something into the brain. And again, here's the crystal structure. We crystallized and solved the structure for uh, transparent receptor. We showed that it binds into the same spot as transparent. You see, it's kind of a raft-like molecule. We call it pontoon molecule, because in this case, the disulfide bonds are lined up in a row. So it looks a little bit like a pontoon. Uh, we crystallized it both in the presence of the transparent receptor and in the absence of the transparent receptor. You see that most of these places line up really well, with the exception of the termini, uh, which kind of flip down when it's binding to transparent uh, receptor, and that kind of locks it into place, but those are in a different uh, configuration when they're in solution. Um, and here we're showing all of the molecules that are within 40 angstroms of the transparent receptor, so we know what not to mess around with, and we know what we can mess around with for other properties like extending serum half-life or things like that. And also, we can tell which of these molecules might be presented to the immune system if for any reason this molecule did get, get, get broken down. And because of that, we can actually design them so that they don't fit into MHC molecules and we can actively make it less immunogenic through computational design as well. So we've got this molecule. Uh, it binds to the transparent receptor, but can it help get a molecule into the brain? And here, I'm showing you that we use genetically engineered mice that have the neurotensin receptor linked to a luciferase construct inside. And I won't go through the whole pathway, but the idea is that if you activate the neurotensin receptor, luciferase will come on and the cells will light up. And so when we have unstimulated mice here, and then we use our fusion, the uh, neurotensin fused to our peptide to bind to the transparent receptor, you can see that these mice brains are lighting up really beautifully. And in contrast to these eight mice that got the peptide and the transparent receptor, uh, this is the one that just got uh, um, neurotensin alone. You can see these four had no difference compared to the baseline. There's one that lit up a little bit, um, but nothing like what we're seeing with this molecule. So that was good, but you could still potentially have an instance where the signal is not necessarily coming from neurons. Uh, it could be in the endothelial cells in the brain. You don't really know what's going on. Um, so we did staining, and you see that these are different brain regions, the cortex, striatum, thalamus, and hippocampus. This is without the peptide, and this is with our first, second, and third generation molecule. And what you see here, it's a little bit hard with this projector, but it's very clear that the signal of luciferase by MNX chemistry is strongest in those that have the generation two molecule. So it's kind of like Goldilocks. You don't want the one that falls off right away, and you don't want the one that sticks forever, you want the one that kind of carries it in there and then releases it, and so that generation two molecule is the one that we're moving forward with. So we're in the process of uh, getting that published right now, and then as I said, we could use that molecule as a carrier for any central nervous system disorder that needs a drug carried in, uh, but also uh, we could potentially link glioma therapeutics, whether immunostimulatory molecules or others to this as a way to attach to um, uh, glioma cells. So I'm just gonna wrap up with uh, a couple slides on a resource that we've generated, just because it might help some of you who are doing uh, research here. And this is in collaboration with Jeff, Amy, Sam, and all the others over at uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. 
Uh, when they do an operation, uh, the cells from that patient are sent over to our lab. They're kind of rushed over while the oper operation is happening. We implant them immediately into NSG mice that are genetically engineered to be able to receive these. We also establish cell cultures from them. Uh, this is the first publication of 30 mouse lines that we made from patient-derived samples. These represent 30 different uh, high-grade uh, pediatric cancers. And between the work that we've done in our lab and the work that we've done in collaborative labs, we now have over 200 models, all completely genomically characterized, all compared to the patient from which they came. They're genomically characterized at an early generation and a later generation, and in cell culture and in mouse models. And we made these resources freely available to anybody in the world with no strings attached. So they're now being used in about 120 labs around the world uh, as well. And here you can see just the genomic um, profiling that helps distinguish those into the subclasses and how they, they link up with, the, with over a thousand different patients worth of data uh, that show us which classes they're in. So if any of you need any of those cell lines, just let me know. And then I want to stop by thanking the team. Uh, I won't go through who did all the work, but I showed you a lot of Zach Crook's work. Both of those last two projects were done by Zach Crook, um, who is a senior staff scientist right here in the lab. And then also the clinical images that I showed you were provided by Blaze Hot Science, uh, which is commercializing uh, the tumor paint molecule. And most of our funding came from NIH uh, as well as Project Pilot. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you might have.